So let's see. And I'm going to message the other recording. Ooh. Don't say anything now you don't want used later. From uh, now. I'm just going to. Uh, um, I'm. My, my name is Michael. I'm new to this group and appreciate you putting on this class, Robbie, virtually. Uh -huh. I don't, I don't see a face. Is that Michael? Yeah. Hi, Michael. I'm uh, sorry about the lack of video. Uh, yeah, okay. it is. <laughs> Hi, sorry about the lack of video. I've just been having all kinds of internet problems. And in fact, no. now the little note came up that says my internet connection is unstable. No, oh, I'm sorry about that. Can you, as long as you can see me, that's all that counts though. I, I, I can see you coming in five by five. Okay, and if you if you want to raise your hand to ask a question, that's not going to work so well. But uh, <laughs> we'll we'll figure out a way to deal with that later. Um, so let me just ask you guys while we're waiting to see if anybody else is going to join us. Um, if you've had any experience with reloading at all, uh, start with Igor. He's shaking his head. No, Tom. No, no I watched a YouTube video. That's my after I heard about this class. Uh, uh -huh. That's my that's the extent of my experience. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Tom, you know, nothing. I my shooting buddy from the '90s, who I still shoot with. You know, he's been reloading since the '90s. I've seen him with his equipment way back then. He doesn't do it anymore. So I, I'm, you know, I've seen it done. I've just never had any hands-on. What about you, Michael? Any experience? Oh, oh we I think he, we we lost Michael. Oh. Hopefully, he comes back on. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. Yeah, if his video, if his internet's a, a little funky, mm. he might get kicked off, but you can just jump back on and we'll let him in right away. Yeah. 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 Were we expecting any others? Did anybody else? Uh, um, yeah, I, I, I sent the link to everybody who had um, signed up for the class. Let me take oh, a look. Yeah. At, let me take a look at uh, how many registrations we have. Yeah. Give me just a second. And anyway, I I sent them the link that um, I sent the link that um, Igor sent me just like I did you, Tom, and said you know it's right. six o'clock on Wednesday Zoom instead and it's no charge and they all said yeah all right. so I thought they'd be here but I don't know. Welcome back, Michael. Welcome back, Michael. <laughs> yeah, there you are. Sorry. That's like I okay, said, my internet know. connection is very unstable. Uh, it yeah, makes working work. from home a challenge. Yeah, not to worry, Michael. Uh, Igor is recording this whole uh, session. So for any uh, reason that you can't come back on, uh, you can rewatch this session. Excellent. Thank you all. So, um, yeah, well, uh, I just have one more person inquire if we're starting now, to which I said yes. Um, so we have, to, we, have, we have two people registered that haven't signed on yet, and that's okay. Calvin and Michael Hoffner. Oh, here comes Calvin. Okay. Okay, good. So none of the ladies, Robin and... Uh, yeah, Robin Nathan. might have to register in order to, you know, but it yeah. takes like a second. You only have to put like... Yeah. Well, I, I sent the messages and said, uh, it's time. And that's as far as mm -hmm. I, I have the time. Mm -hmm. You guys are here and I'm not gonna spend too much yeah. more time trying to put Yeah, I, like we said, anybody that misses it can rewatch this session now that you were recording. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Hi, Calvin. Welcome. Hey, Calvin. Hi. Oh, there was Calvin. Hi, Calvin. <laughs> Hi. Glad you could make it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's cool to see everybody uh, full faces. Uh, we know it. It right now. It's not the mess. Oh, it's everywhere. Oh, no. <laughs> See what happens. I get excited. There's bullets. <laughs> bullets flying. All right. Well, let's go ahead and start before I make another mess. Throwing things around like my phone. Put my phone down. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, <clears throat> my name is Robbie. Carno, and uh, I will be your instructor today. <clears throat> um, my own reloading experience, I started reloading in 2016. I was taught by my best friend's husband, who is a hunter, and he reloads for super precision with his own particular firearms. 
Um, so he taught me a very precise way of doing it. I took the class that was offered at uh, Angeles Crest Reloading, which is attached to the Angeles Shooting Range. Uh, that was a two-day class, eight hours a day for two days. I took that class. I also took the class with uh, All Safe. So that was a one-day class in Orange. Uh, and that's where I got my instructor certification for reloading. So I've been re reloading for a few years now. And I only do pistol. And this class will only be dealing with pistol, um, straight wall pistol um, cartridges, just so we're clear on that. I, I don't do rifle. And I don't want to teach rifle because there, uh, I'll mention some of the differences between rifle and pistol um, when we get to those those differences, but that's it's just pistol today. So I hope that's okay with everybody, and then you can extrapolate, you know, find out the extra information you would need for rifle uh, from someone who does rifle. Wait, I, I, I thought you were going to teach us how to build IEDs today. <laughs> Check my notes. No, that's that's uh, another session. Sorry. Okay, that's the advanced class. That's the yeah. advanced class. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So before we go any farther, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Am I, yeah. am I okay? All right, because I'm not used to doing the Zoom lecture. I've only done family, you know, silly family stuff. So, okay. So uh, if you guys have any questions as we're going along, um, there's three types of questions. There's no bad questions, of course. There's a question that's pertinent to the moment. There's a question where I'm going to say to you, great question. I'm actually going to address that in a few minutes. And then there's some questions I'm going to say, let's save that for later so we don't disrupt the flow of the, the matter, the subject matter. So feel free to ask your questions. I'm just going to categorize it in one of those three categories and, and deal with it either immediately, a little bit later, or a lot later. Okay? All good? All right. Okay, so why reload? That's the first question. Um, the, the saying is, when you reload, you don't save money, you just shoot more. Um, obviously, reloading an individual cartridge it, cost less than purchasing an individual cartridge. Um, Pre-COVID, uh, it was costing me about 11 cents to make a nine millimeter round. Um, when it came to, you know, and, and, and nine millimeters probably the least cost effective round to reload because they are the most common and tend to be the relatively least expensive, you know, pre-COVID. Pre um, but I reload 38s and 32s and 45s, and those, the benefit, I'm, I'm spending almost the same amount as I do for nine millimeter, 11 to 15 cents a round, but I'd pay a heck of a lot more than that per round to buy those um, on the shelf. So you do save money. Um, of course, you have to buy all this equipment, so <laughs> that kind, of, kind of knocks off your money saving unless you do a lot of it. Uh, more importantly, though, than saving money is that you can customize your load to your firearm. And as we uh, get further into the discussion tonight, <clears throat> um, we'll talk about how you can do that. But you can make a load that will hit the bullseye better for your gun than a different load. And by making several different loads of a certain combination of powder and bullet, um, you'll find the load that your gun shoots best. So, for example, um, I like to shoot CZs, and I've made um, the rounds I make for my CZ are the ones that, for me, are most likely to be accurate. Um, so, and I tested that by shooting the different, I made up a bunch of different rounds and I shot them at the target. So, oh, look, this one was hitting the bullseye better than the others. So, rifle, even more so, um, you can make precision rounds. Or if you're doing long distance pistol shooting, you can really tailor the round to your particular firearm. Um, and also, it's, it's a good, uh, economical and ecological thing. So you reuse the brass. Um, where's the brass? You reuse brass at the range. So if you're going to start reloading, start saving brass now because you're going to need it. Pick up your brass. Uh, pick up everybody else's brass. Um, but then recycle the brass because that's probably the single most expensive component in reloading is the brass. Um, bullets, everything's gone up since COVID. Um, so the prices I, I think of in my head are pre-COVID. I haven't bought any components since COVID. But you know, bullets maybe 10 cents, five cents, depends on if it's lead, if it's coated, if it's, uh, you know, maybe you could pay a lot more uh, for a, a Hornady, um, you know, hollow point, XTP tip or whatever. Um, the powder negligible, an entire pound of powder 
$30 and you're using grains of powder. Um, primers, five cents or less for the primers. Um, brass to buy, brass is, is the single most expensive, probably 20 to 25 cents per round. So if you can recycle your brass, Robbie, that's the same. I, I, yes, I have a question about that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do do rangers care if you pick up your your own brass or or, or other people's? Rangers never care if you pick up your own brass. Hmm. Some rangers do care if you pick up other people's brass, um, particularly if they collect the brass, like LAX okay. collects the brass for their own use. Um, usually, that'll be listed in the range rules about if you're allowed to pick up brass or not. If um, I, I don't worry too much about nine millimeter. It's readily picked up at the outdoor ranges and such. But if the guy next to me is shooting 45 and he doesn't seem to be picking it up, I'll say, hey, may I have your 45 brass? It's on the ground, I'll pick it up. Then they're, you know, so ask the person uh, individually. But yeah, running around a range and picking up everybody else's brass, people might get irritated if you're behind them and like <laughs> they take a step back and trip over you or something. So you do have to be kind of conscious of uh, not being too obnoxious about it. Right. But yeah, individual ranges have rules, yes or no, whether you can uh, collect brass. Got it. Thank What's you for that. Good to know. Okay. okay. All right. So let's talk about the actual components. So I mentioned the brass, and you know that there's there's four. You all learned that there's four basic components to a, a cartridge. Um, so of course we got brass, right, which is the container that holds everything, and you've got the primers, and there's a little. They're very tiny. And can you see that on camera, the little primer? It's just that little silver thing that goes in the pocket of the, uh, there's a pocket at the bottom, right? You guys have all seen this, right? This is not really new. Um, powder, usually, like I said, it, it comes, it's sold, and usually in a pound, here's a pound of tight group. Um, there's a pound of unique, but different containers, but same thing. <clears throat> and, um, the, remember that this the powder that we use for reloading is called smokeless powder. It's not the black powder that you would find in a old muzzle loading uh, blunderbuss or something. So be sure you're using smokeless powder, not black powder. Very different stuff. Um, the this powder it burns very very fast when you apply a fire to it. But otherwise it's inert. I mean it's in a plastic container. This is how they sell it. It's plastic. It's not like it's in a a safe in a massive metal container. <laughs> it's fertilizer. If you spill it on the floor, just sweep it up and throw it out in your grass. Um, there's oh. nothing you know, to worry about. As long as you don't apply a flame to it or strike a primer on it, it nothing's going to happen. If it does do it, it's just going to burn really fast. Um, but if it's not enclosed in a container like a completed cartridge, it's just going to go poof. In the cartridge, it builds pressure and that's what sends the bullet down the barrel. So, um, But other than that, powder is just Fertilizer. Um, powder comes in different uh, shapes. There's cylinders, there's flake, there's round balls. For pistols, it's almost always going to be flake. Um, when they talk about burn rates for powder, you, for pistols, you want to use fast burn rates. So if you see a chart that lists all the different powders from fastest to slowest, you're going to want to pick something from that top part of the, of the list. Rifle powders burn slower because they've got to keep that projectile going down that long barrel. Whereas in a pistol with a short barrel, you want it to burn very fast, quickly be done, because that bullet's going to be gone. You don't want powder still burning long after the bullet's way down the barrel and, and out the range. Um, so fast powder, faster uh, of the, pow the smokeless powders. And then, of course, the last component is a bullet. And I just have a few here. So you can get. Uh, this is just a coated bullet with a poly coat by a company called Blue Bullets. There's many different companies that make versions of these in red and brown. And here's a brown one, or maybe it's a red one. Yeah. That one happens to be a shoulder to semi wad cutter. Um, you can get a total wad cutter, hollow point. This one's a copper jack or copper um, plated, not jacketed. You can buy jacketed. But personally, I don't know why you would want to spend the money on a jacketed bullet when you can buy a plated bullet and you're just reloading, you're trying to save money. And that's just, so just different bullets. Um, 
Javi, what's the most cost effective of those bullets if we're just reloading for the for range ammo? Uh, you want to go with something that's just basically coated lead. Coated um, lead. Yeah. So like the, these three that I, I showed that had the different colors, coated these lead. are all, I'm not sure how to do this on Zoom. Okay. So well. These are all just, they're lead projectiles, but they have a coating on them to protect you from touching lead directly. Uh, Otherwise, yeah. The, I mean, the single most cost effective way to do it is to mold your own lead, but that's a whole subject <laughs> I don't even want to get into. Right. Involves melting the lead and molds, high lead exposure. Yeah, you save money, but it's just so much extra work that I think it gets beyond, you know, for, for bullets, for pistols where you're shooting rounds, you know, rifle maybe, but it, it seems like a lot of work to me yeah. to, to melt your own lead. It's, what's the, be, what's the average cost of those bullets? Uh, Pre-COVID prices, um, 10 cents around. Okay. Um, I think the least expensive ones, about 8 cents and maybe, now if you go into the Hornady defensive round bullets that you can buy, those, and you're going to pay a lot more. But I will say right now, if you're going to, if you're talking about defensive rounds, buy those. Don't make your own defensive rounds. If you're talking about to be used for actual defense, you can make your own homemade bullet that simulates the the speed for example when we talk about chronograph um you know if if you know that your hornady self you know critical defense round goes at 1100 feet per second make your own homemade round that does 1100 feet per second and then use that for practice so there's not a big difference between that and your self-defense round but tr trust the uh manufacturer on the self-defense rounds don't trust yourself just because your life if your life's going to depend on it you know, this is a hobby. Let the professionals take care of those rounds. Okay. All right. Any any other questions about uh, the components we're talking about? Good. Okay. There are. I have a question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Is there like... any like a specific bullet for just for the for the range for the outdoor or? Um, I just, for my own. I, I think I have one here. Where is it? Where did I put it? Um, I used the, this is what we're going to, I'm going to demo with today. This is just a round nose plate or um, coated lead bullet. Just plain mm -hmm. old round nose. That's what I use for my day-to-day -day range ammo. Um, round bullet? Round bullet, they call it. Just a round, round nose? Bullet. Round, round yeah. nose. I don't know where my round. head one's sitting here. Anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, you can use anything. This, this is what I use for my everyday revolver. That's my 38 special round. It's a kind of a semi wad cutter that I use for mm. range. No particular reason, just I bought it. All right, thank you. I like. So, um, right. yeah, it's whatever whatever suits your fancy. Whatever you know, if you're worried about price, whatever is economical, um, whatever you can get a hold of. Right now, it's whatever you can get a hold of. Any other questions? No, thank you. Okay. All right. So the the five basic steps in reloading. Um, first step is going to be resizing. That's where you're going to take your, and I'll get into the details when we actually start messing with the press. Resizing is where you, um, after this has been used in a firing situation, boom, this is expanded a little bit. So the step of resizing is bringing it back um, to its original size and shape. Getting rid of any little dents that it got because someone stepped on it and bringing the brass back in because it's expanded from the uh, explosion that happened earlier. Um, sometimes in that same step will be the depriming, which is when the, so I've got here, got the primer in, deprimer out. So that's depriming. Um, then we're gonna put the primer in and add powder. Uh, we're going to seat the bullet and then we're going to crimp the round. So those are the steps we're going to go through with the with the press. So I'm, I'm not going to ask if there's any questions because we'll get into that more as we actually do it. Well, let's talk real quick about safety. Um, ideally, you want to make sure you're wearing eye protection and sometimes even ear protection if you're worried about something exploding on you. But 
uh, that shouldn't happen. Um, follow the published data. We'll talk about published data in a little bit, but always follow the data that's printed. Don't go off and make up your own low data willy nilly. Um, as I said before, only use smokeless powder. Um, only use powder that's in a clearly labeled uh, bottle. Don't mix powders. Um, don't, if someone gives you a jar and says, oh, this is some powder I used and there's no label on it and it's, you know, it's open and you don't know for sure what's in it, don't use it. Just say, thanks, no thanks, I'll, I'll buy my own. It's not that expensive. Um, set up a routine um, as you go through and stick to it. So like I said before, I was taught by a, a friend who's a, a rifle, a rifle guy and he said do it this way and that's how I when I'm using a single stage press I just do it that way even though I'm <clears throat> not doing rifle I just I just do it the way he taught me and that's the pattern I have and that's so I don't miss a step or do something stupid uh, or wrong um, you know so find your find a rhythm and stick to it um, always be aware and sober and awake don't be distracted don't watch TV while you're reloading um, be sure you store your powder properly and your primers properly and don't store them together. Proper primer, I keep my primers in a closet in the house. Um, the primers are the single most dangerous part uh, component as far as, but they require impact to, to be dangerous. So I keep them in a limit closet and they're away from the powder that way. The powder I keep in a wooden trunk in the garage. Um, and you want, the, I, the primers I keep in the house because I want them temperature controlled. I don't want them exposed to heat and humidity and whatever else is on the outside. Um, by keeping the powder in a big wooden trunk, I'm also kind of, that plus the sealed jar kind of protects it from too much exposure to heat, humidity and changes in temperature. Um, and I don't want, the powder will burn very fast. I don't want the powder in the house in case the house catches on fire. And I don't want the powder burning really fast in the, in the front closet. I can't get out of the house because there's this huge fireball of uh, gunpowder going off. It doesn't explode though. It won't go kapoom. It just goes Psh! It's fire. It's not explosion. Um, uh, and then don't eat and drink while you're reloading, she says as she grabs a drink and fixes it. Um, you, you will be exposed a little bit to lead, uh, the dirty, um, cart the dirty brass, the primers, the bullets, uh, if lead's an issue, wear rubber gloves. I'm looking at you, Tom. Uh, <laughs> just wear rubber, you know, like rubber, um, protective gloves to prevent ex um, extra exposure you don't need in your life. So any question about the safety rules? Okay. Okay. All right, move along. All right. Um, now, going back to the components a little bit more. Um, with when it comes to primers, there are small and large, and there's rifle and pistol, and there's regular and magnum. For pistols, of course, you won't be using rifle primers. Uh, small pistol primers are for everything up to probably, I'm guessing, 40 although I'm not 100% sure. I know 45s actually, some cases take the small and some take the large, so you have to be aware. But for nine millimeter that we're talking about today, it'll be small. Um, magnum primers would be used for 45, 44 magnum, 357 magnum, but you wouldn't want to use a magnum primer on a regular nine millimeter round. Um, again, the low data will tell you what primer you want to use. Um, let's see, so we talked about the speed of the, of the powder and uh, not mixing them. Um, you can measure powder by weight or volume. Um, so measuring by weight is what I usually do. The way you measure by volume, you can use something like this to measure your powder. I don't do it that way, um, but it certainly is doable. Um, so I'm gonna move my camera. So you my scale over here. Let's see if I can do this. 
Where's my scale? There it is. There's my little beam scale. Um, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much how you're going to do the powder. Um, Robbie, Robbie. Yes. Is the reason why you you measure by weight is that more precise than measuring it by volume? Yes, um, it's it's more repeatable. Um, repeatable I mean, okay. there, there's the, like a, they're using this little scoop. Um, for example, there's very specific technique to it. You want to push this into the powder and let it fill, and then lift it up. You don't want to scoop it because that would compact it. And the you know faster you scoop it, the more it would be compacted. So it would change the actual number of grains of powder. So it's a very to to make this reproducible is a little more tricky. Um, there are some automated powder dispensers that use um, volume, but those are automated, and so there's not going to be the variation of me doing this with the scoop and such. Um, when we talk about developing loads, and you'll see that using the scale um, combined with what we call a, a trickler, which is this little guy here. And this is full of powder. I already put some powder in there. If you can see there's powder in there. Uh, this little guy, you can actually add individual flakes to your scale to get the exact weight you want to load that particular round that you're, um, that you're making. Uh, let's see, right now we're talking kind of, right now this part of the discussion is sort of just covering all the basics of how this all works. And when we actually start putting pieces together in the press, um, it'll all come together better. I think it'll, it'll all make more sense. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's a couple different kinds of presses. Um, and you can only see the, I'm gonna try to show you, this is a single stage press. So let's see if I can see, show it to you from the side. Let's see if my cat gets in the picture. Whoops. Oh, where is it? Where's my press? There it is. Can you see that? There's the, that's a single stage press. So it happens to be an RCBS um, press. There we go. It's called a rock chucker by my name. Um, there's also turret presses. So with a single stage press, you put the die in. So take a die, you put it in, you do that operation 50 times or how many times take that die out, put the next die in, repeat the operations, and so on and so forth. So you're, it's, um, <clears throat> it's not an assembly line. It's one step, and then the next step in large quantities. A turret press, the dies are all on a spindle, and you put the cartridge in, and you do one step, turn it, one step. So you make one round, you're turning the, the um, the dies around click by click to do all the steps in sequence and make one round. A progressive press, and I have one I'm going to pull out at the end and show you that one in operation. That one, the dies stay in place. There's a turntable. You load a cartridge, and every time you pull the handle, all four dies do one step, their particular step. And then you pull the handle again. Everything moves and does it again. So you're a uh, um, you're doing the process of th four cartridges at the same time. First cartridge is getting resized, the second one's getting the powder, the third one's seating the bullet, the fourth one's getting crimped. And every time you pull the handle, so that one's the most efficient and will get you your rounds done faster. So I always use the progressive press. I only use the uh, single stage anymore when I'm developing a new load because it's easier for me to do the powder. Um, in a single stage, because the progressive includes the powder operation, so it's all all one big operation. Hey, hey Robbie, um, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, I'm not sure if you heard me when I was introducing myself, but um, I've uh, I actually have purchased a progressive. Um, yeah, you got and, the 750, right? Um, it's a Hornaday. It's in oh, a it's box. Already. Yeah, <laughs> it's still in the box, um, uh, primarily because um, I was um, a, a little um, intimidated by it. But uh, I heard that um, that we should all start off on single 
single stage. Uh, can you can you maybe speak to that a little bit and and what what you know now that you're you know an experienced reloader and actually teaching classes? What yeah. what is your thought on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can use a progressive press as a single stage um, by so as, as you've got the um, I, I'm not as familiar with the horn yet. I have a Dylan, but um, it's got some sort of carousel that you put the you're loading the brass in at one stage, and it comes around, and at the end it pops out the other stage completed. Correct. Well, if you just you can load the bullet in different locations, so you can put them in, resize it, and take it off, put another one in, resize. It. So you can single stage with a progressive. It's a little less. It's not as easy, but it's perfectly doable. Um, uh, the, the, the idea, the thing, I'm not, I'm not gonna say that you need to start with a single stage press to learn to reload so much as, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. I saw someone post on Facebook just a couple days ago that they had just finished making 500 rounds on their new um, uh, progressive reloading press. And I, I thought to myself, did they work up a load or did they just crank out 500 rounds without having any idea of how that load's going to work out in their firearm? The mm -hmm. first few rounds I made um, weren't po powerful enough to run the slide on my Beretta. Um, the first couple of rounds I made for my revolver <laughs> weren't powerful enough to get the bullet out the, chain, out the barrel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and there, I found there was, I was there was good loads. Yeah, it was a little embarrassing, but you know, I was new and I was being really super cautious. And so I was loading them with a very minimum amount of, of powder and realized it was way too minimum. Um, but I didn't have 500 rounds <laughs> finished at that point. I only had, I had made five rounds, took them to the range, went, okay, that's not gonna work. Went home, started again. Uh, so it's important that you, really understand what you're trying to accomplish before you go cranking out on a progressive press hundreds of rounds um so so start out you know it's brand new and it, calvin you also have the you uh, i just got my 750 you but it's dylan. still on the box <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah that's me um, yeah that's from it, dylan yeah don't don't go to town right away you know make just a few rounds um, and I'll talk about that again, like I said, later when we talk about developing loads, make just a few rounds and then test them and see what, you know, have some experience with, okay, these are the rounds I made and this is what happened. It wasn't enough to cycle the slide or, wow, that was way too powerful. I didn't like that. That felt my hand or whatever um, before you, but yeah, you can use the progressive as a single stage just by choosing where you insert the, the brass in the, uh, I'll show you when I put the uh, progressive up here. Um, okay. You Thank you. Okay. So I just want to make sure I understand correctly from mm -hmm. Michael's yeah. question. Yeah. So it's okay for like Calvin and Michael and beginners to get a progressive, mm -hmm. but you're saying start out conservative and slow and, and use it as a single stage first? Turn to use that as a single stage first? Yeah. Until, until you really understand what you're doing and most importantly, until you know how the load you make is going to be uh, uh, work in your firearm because if you if you make a hundred rounds and find out they won't cycle your gun you now have a hundred rounds of ammunition that you can't use because it won't cycle your gun got it what's the uh what's the average cost of each of these single versus turret and progressive um single stage presses like this this rcbs that i have um and again these prices are what i paid and i you know, this I bought in 2016. Um, I don't think they've gone up that much. If you can find them, I think is a bigger, <laughs> there's been a, a run on them. Uh, this came as a, a, a kit. It came with the press. It came with the, um, the loading block. It came with the scale, it came with the funnel, a few other things. Um, I think this was around, it was under $300. I want to say $250 as a kit with all sorts of, um, Parts. I still had to add to that the powder measure and a few other things. Uh, the progressive, the progressive I have, the uh, which is a Dillon Square Deal B is called, um, only does pistol rounds, and that one's about 
I want to say 350, I want to say between 350 and 400. I'm not 100% sure. When you get into the, like the Dillon 750, what'd you pay about 800? Uh, <laughs> 1500. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's a package for yeah, nine okay. millimeters. Yeah, that was that's that one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think there's a there's a there's after the square deal B, there's a the five fifty, there's a six fifty. Mine is seven fifty XL. They have the XL. XL. There's the yeah. ten fifty, which is like that's what you would use if you're I think nine two thousand. That's two thousand. Yeah. Oh okay. Yeah. It's expensive. <laughs> I think hey. the five fifty is um five fifty V B is, is Okay. It's, 550 is a, a much less expensive. <laughs> um, well, but yeah, the progressives are going to be more. Ex I don't know the prices on tours. I never, I never looked at, into it because when I once I got comfortable doing reloading, I said I'm going to get a progressive. I, I went straight to progressive. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, progressives are going to be more expensive than single stages, obviously. And, and they're cheaper than the RCBS. I think these are less expensive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I would say go for the progressive, use it as a single stage if you think that you're gonna if if you're gonna buy a reloader and you know that you're going to be doing reloading. It's like I, I am committed to doing reloading, spend the money, get the better thing. My grandmother always said, You'll forget how much you spent if you buy what you like, but you'll always, you know, regret when you spend too little. Um, and you'll end up buying the more expensive thing anyway. So <laughs> um, Robbie, are you it's kind of a basic question. Yeah. Ranges, ranges don't care if you try your own rounds, do they? Or, or oh, they no. Yeah. As long as it, as long as your rounds are whatever their specifications, if they have um, a lot of ranges, they want to see your ammo. They don't want you to use, um, you know, steel or whatever. You know, whatever their restrictions are. Some some ranges don't want hollow points. Some ranges don't like um, if you use uh, uncoated lead. Um, whatever their requirements are. They don't care if you made it yourself or if you bought it, as long as it's um, conforms to their requirements. Okay. And you know, you never have to worry about steel casing because you can't reload steel case. Yeah. You ha it has to be brass or another malleable metal. Yeah. Um, and usually, when when they ask to see my rounds and I open up my little homemade box, I go, "Oh, you reload? Cool!" You know, they're they're all impressed. So, <laughs> so it's a it's a positive. Um, Okay, so uh, let's see. Okay, so so the scales I showed you, I tried to show you my little. I'll, I'll pick it up, maybe it's easier. So you know, there's the beam scale, right, for measuring powder. Um, you could also get something that uses a battery like this. It's a little pocket one. They make big fancy ones that are way more expensive. Um, so there's there's different ways to measure your powder by weight, but those are the two basic electric scale or a beam scale. Um, some other tools you're going to need um, pre-reloading, you're going to need to clean the brass. If you're using range brass, you're re recycling your brass, you're going to need to clean it. Uh, the two ways to clean are dry tumbling or wet tumbling. Uh, dry tumbling uses corn cob or walnut shell media that you buy in a big bag. Um, did anybody ever do rock tumbling when they were younger? Like take rocks and put it in a tumbler to make them all shiny? Well, it's the same process anyway. It's a vibrator. You put the brass in with the medium and sometimes you'll throw in a little uh, shiny um, polish liquid in there and it vibrates and cleans off all the old smoke and, and grit and whatever else was on the, uh, the brass. Takes about two hours in the tumbler to um, complete the process. Um, it's less expensive than the wet method, and you can once you finish when you get it out of the um, medium, you can go right to reloading. It's it's dry. Uh, some of the downsides are that you could get there could be medium in the in the shell or still in the brass that might get in the way. I, I had that happen once and was a little piece of that uh, medium down in the primer pocket when I went to go, you know, kind of crunch and made a little bit of a mess, but nothing drastic, just. Um, uh, 
the wet method uses stainless steel, um, little stainless steel rods or beads in a wet, in, in water, and it tumbles it. It only takes about half an hour, I think. I, I don't do it, so I'm not 100% sure, but it, it, it's a pretty fast process. It does clean the brass much more so than the, the corn cob and the walnut is more polishing as it removes the grit by polishing it off, whereas the wet is actually like a washing machine. It's actually washing it off. Um, but those little stainless steel beads are expensive and you've got to try not to lose any when you dump the thing out and you've got to dry your brass when you're done. Um, you can put them in the oven at a very low temperature. Um, you can, I think there are drying machines that um, you can buy for the purpose. Um, so, so those are the kind of advantages and disadvantages of, of the two methods. Uh, I personally do the dry method. So I usually, I get home, when I get a bunch of brass, I throw it in the tumbler, I set it off in the garage, I set a timer for two hours, I come inside, do whatever. After two hours, I go out, dump it, and I'm, it's ready to go for the next time I'm going to do some reloading. Any questions about uh, cleaning the brass? Okay. Uh, earlier, I mentioned the difference between rifle and pistol. Um, let me just touch on that really quickly. With a pistol, you can reuse the brass as long as it looks fine. If you start to see evidence of that the brass is bad, well, you know, cracks or bulges, and you, you toss it. But you can reload pistol brass over and over and over and over and over and over. I, I've been told 50 times is not an unreasonable thing when it comes to pistol brass. Whereas rifle brass, four to five reloads, there's so much higher pressure, so much higher speed that um, they just, they wear out faster. Um, so that's one difference between pistol and rifle. Um, also with the pistol, you clean it and you go to work. Rifle, after you clean it, you have to trim it, deburr it. Because of the neck, the, um, the shoulders and the neck on a rifle round, that has to be exactly right length. So it's expanded by, the, by being fired. So you have to trim it back to the proper length and then deburr it, clean up at the edge of where you've trimmed it. There's a lot more steps involved in, uh, in doing that. So pistol, lots, e lots easier than rifle. Um, so there's a couple of the differences between those two. Um, other tools that you might need. Uh, this is uh, the case block. I think I flashed it by you. And this just is a place where you put your you put your brasses in the uh, in there. So as I'm going along, when I'm using the single stage, you know, I'll, I'll do it, put it in the block, do it, put it in the block. When that's done, I'll, then I'll put the powder in, put them in the block. It's just a place to keep track of everything. Because um, once you put the powder in, if you're doing single stage, you put the powder in, you don't want them falling over. So it just holds them in place. You can, then you can look in there with a flashlight, make sure everybody's got powder before you set the bullets in. Uh, you also need a priming tool. Um, you can prime on the press or you can use a priming tool. And there's a priming tool here. Uh, I've got there's some primers in here and you just, uh, you put your, the brass goes in there, you let the primer fall and you squeeze, and that'll seat your, seat your primer. And we'll do that for real in a minute. Um, the, the press actually has a priming tool also in it. Um, I prefer priming mine when I'm doing single stage. Before I got the progressive, what I would do is I would resize and deprime everything. And then I'd come in the house with the primers uh, and sit in front of the TV and prime on my press. Uh, and then I'd leave it for a few days and go back out and then start the next step. Um, when you do it in the press, it's you have to handle each primer one at a time and it's a little bit less easy for me. Um, but it certainly saves you the cost of a priming tool. Uh, okay. All right, I think we are ready to start actually priming. Uh, doing this. All right, we are ready to actually do this now. Anybody have any questions before I start the real demo part? No? Okay. Now this would have been, a, this part would have been a lot easier if we weren't doing Zoom. I'm going to try to 
sit this where you can see what's going on, but don't know how well it can accomplish that. So I apologize in advance. Um, what you can see. There we go. Okay, so front. This is let's see. Make it. There we go. I don't know if this is good. without dropping. Oh wait. Oh, yes, maybe. Oh. <laughs> Give me a second, guys. I'm just trying to lift this. I'm behind it. Tablet to fall on its face. Oh, there we go. Okay, that sort of worked. Okay. <laughs> um, so the first die we're going to use is the resizer um, deep primer. You see at the end the thing sticking out. That's going to be the part that actually will deep prime the brass. Uh, the way these are set in, so you set this in. Now, I, I'm using leap dies, um, but whatever dies you have will come with instructions. Well, here's my set of instructions that came with the dies, and they'll tell you how many, how far down to screw each die and what to do with it. Uh, the other half of the system is the shell holder, um, and that's going to go in the press. So I, I'm going to have to try this, something different with this again. Let me see. I can put this where you can see what's going on. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm going to make this as useful as possible. See the press? I'm sorry about the lighting. You can see what's going on a little bit there. You can see the ram going up and down. Yeah, I can see it. Looks good. Okay. So I'm going to put the uh, shell holder in the press, and I'm going to take this. So I, what I want with this die is I want to screw it down until it. Of course, mine are already set up, so till it touches that shell holder. From when it touches the shell holder, I'm just gonna back it off a little bit. And then there's a locking nut. And I'm not gonna worry, normally I, I grab a wrench and wrench that lock. I'm not gonna worry about that today to save time. So I just want that little bit of a gap. So that's why I backed it off just to, you know, half turn or so. But I want, I want as much of the brass to get engaged in there as possible. So I'm going to take my, so this is my clean brass that I've tumbled already. I'm going to stick it in the shell holder and ram it in. And pull it out. And the primer has got shoved out. I caught it at the other end. There's the primer that came out. And now I have a deep primed piece of brass that's been resized. Now to, if I want to put the primer in at this stage, can you see this little thing flipping around here? That's where you'll put the primer. So I'll take a primer, got one right here, and I'm going to put it in the head of that little guy. Let's see. I don't know if you guys can see this or not, and again, I apologize. Um, so when I lift the ram, did you see that drop down? Yeah. yeah. And when I bring the ram down, I don't know if you can see the primer is sticking out now. Mm -hmm. You see the primer here, where my finger is? Yeah. I see your cute little cat. Uh oh. <laughs> Look out, Teddy, you're on camera. Uh, all right, let's see, where's my finger? That's my thumb, what's my thumb doing there? Uh, that's my head. Uh, no. I'm sorry, guys, <laughs> I'm trying, but it's not as easy as it looks. Um, let me just take my word for it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry, we'll see. All right, well, anyway, the, the primer is right here. Mm -hmm. So when I lower the ram, this is in the way. There it is. So 
after I've resized, I'm gonna put this brass back in. After I've resized it, when I lower the, pri the, the ram, and then I push down, and you gotta kind of push hard. And hopefully, there it is. The primer is now there. You go. There it oh. is. In, the, in there. Interesting. So that's that's how you put the primer in using the press. To put the primer in using the priming tool. This is a brass that I deprimed earlier. Um, that just goes in the holder and the primers are in this tray. You can see them running around in there. And, and then when I squeeze this handle, hopefully now it's primed. So those are the two ways to prime the breath with the separate tool or you can do it on the press. That was my scale getting rammed on. Okay. Robbie, All right. how much, now how that much, we have yeah. How much is that how much is the priming tool? It it seems like that's way more efficient using the priming tool. Than doing yeah, it the hand primer is much more efficient. Um, again, it's been a few years. Uh, I want to say somewhere between fifty and hundred dollars, but don't quote me. Um, I, I don't remember, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> but yeah, and and there's a couple different kinds. Um, the one that I just demonstrated with has a uses a spring loaded mechanism here. Um, that holds the brass. So this will hold brass nine millimeter, 38, 40, you know, hold all different sizes of brass. So I use this for most of those. Um, there's another style that will use the same kind of shell holder that the press uses. Um, so the problem with that is that you have, if for me, because I load lots of different um, cartridges, 45s and nine millimeters and 38s and 32s, um, changing the shell holder is kind of a pain in the, you know what, on that um, on that device, so that that version that has the adaptable is is nice um, for that reason because you don't if you're doing lots of different kinds of if you're only going to do nine millimeter you're only going to do forty five or whatever it's not as important but the more different rounds you do uh, the more that comes handy. Any other questions about uh, resizing depriming? So now I've got to make sure I keep track of my primed. Let me prime a couple more real quick. Just so, once I put powder in, if there's no primer, the powder all flies out the other end, and that's no fun either. So I'm just going to have make sure I have a few primed rounds here. And this is way more. I like this way better. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's, okay, that's fine. That's good. Okay. Um, the next die in the series is this one. And this one is going to kind of bell the mouth of the die, of the uh, brass. So having resized it, I can't get the bullet in. It won't go in there. On a, and this is one that I haven't resized yet. I can actually get that in there. Okay. Because it, it expanded when it fired. But once it's resized, it won't go in anymore. It's just too narrow. So this next die is going to make a little bit of a flare at the top. Again, following your instructions on exactly where to set this up. Um, I haven't used this one in a while. Um, this die also has an opening if you want to put the powder in at the same time you can do that um, but because i always measure my powder um, individually i don't like to use this particular feature but it is there for those who want to uh, you can measure out your powder and pour it in at the same time that you do this operation so when i push this one in it's really subtle 
Let's see. I don't know if you can see the difference or not. Probably yeah. not. Actually, I can but, see it. Yeah. But you can really see the difference because now, where's my, where am I on my camera? There we go. Now the bullet's in there. It won't come out. Well, it will come. It doesn't go in very much. You don't want to bell it out too much because you're creating um, stress on the metal, wear and tear on your, on your brass. You just want it in there so that it will sit in there and not, I usually listen for a little bit of a, a little pop. Oh, uh, I know it's in there enough. Just a little bit, just to get it, it's like a starter. So we've got si resized, primed, and flared. So now we're ready for powder. Um, now I have, where's my recipe card? So here's where I wanna talk about doing the reload um, for your particular firearm. And somewhere I had, Oh, anyways, okay, so here, ah, so here's where we're going to start talking about reloading manuals, because this is where this stuff just starts to be important. Um, I like to have, I have lots of reloading manuals. This one is um, the one by Lee. Uh, this one uh, is by Hornady. This one is by Lyman. You can see it's had some wear and tear over the years. Um, the trick is that each reloading manual is going to have uh, its own thing. So the Hornady reloading manual is great if you're using Hornady bullets. If you're using anything else, it's kind of not so helpful. Um, Lyman is mostly concerned with, they, they sell molds for lead, for you know, when you make your own lead bullets. So they're kind of more geared for that. So if you're only going to be able to find one, I, I would I would go with the Lee. Um, but ideally, get more than one. The um, they make what are they called? There's little little paperback. Um, they're like five by nine paperbacks. Um, and what do they call them? They're they're the pages from different reloading manuals for all one cartridge. You'll see they have paper covers in blue and pink and yellow and, um, and you'll see those at the reloading stores or in the, in the catalogs online. And really what they've done is they've reproduced pages from, so if you get the nine millimeter version, for example, it'll have pages from the Hornady book and pages from the Lyman book and pages from the Nossler book and page. It's just reproduction of pages from a different, different manuals. And those are helpful um, because it has lots of different variety. Uh, this particular company that makes powder, Hod, 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 I can't pronounce that, Hodgen, H-O-D-G-D-O-N, Hodgen, which is the powder I use. Um, I use diff several different of theirs. They have a great online, uh, on the, a website with reloading data for their powders. And it's really nice because you, you know, nine millimeter, 125 grain, and I want to use tight group and they'll tell you all the different formulas for that. So let's let's look up nine millimeter, shall we? Funny, I put a I put a uh, put a bookmark right in there. All right, so this is gonna <laughs> try to show you again. My my intention for the day we were gonna do this in person was to give everybody their own book and say, okay, you guys look up some data for me. So you can see this is a very confusing page. <laughs> right? I don't know what you can see or not see on this. Um, can you read that at all? Can you see anything? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what, what you have is, so for example, this is 125 grain lead bullet at the top of the page. Right here, where my finger was. These different columns have different, the gray columns have the different, so the very top one is 125 grain lead bullet, which is what we're gonna be using. My little blue bullet is 125 grain lead bullet. Then down the side, we have all the different powders. And lucky for us, there's tight group, which is the powder I have. And then what it's gonna say is minimum starting grains, and it says 3.6. And then some of these other numbers are, because Lee, the one of, Lee is the one that makes these little yellow things. So one of these other columns is what size of this thing to use and so forth. Um, we'll skip all that. And then it'll say, 
um, never exceed, and for tight group, they said never exceed, uh, looks like 4.0. I think that's what it says, 4.0. So 3.6 to 4.0 is the range uh, for that powder. It also tells you the velocity. So it's saying at 3.6, you're going to get 1,000. And at 4.0, you're going to get 1096. And then the last column is the, uh, what they call the OAL. Sometimes they'll call it COL or CAL. It's the overall length of the cartridge. And they're telling you 1.125 overall length. OK? So this is what I have. This is the load I developed for my CZ round. So what I did is, and I should have brought my other cards. When I first developed the load, so, so let's go back to that, that data we just talked about. Minimum load 3.6, maximum 4.0. So what I would do with that information and my single stage press is I would make five rounds each, a 3.6, a 3.7, a 3.8 and a 3.9. I probably wouldn't make the 4.0 to start. Um, if you if you have no pre, now I'm using tight group. That's the powder I have. If you have if if you get to, I'm going to choose a powder from this book. Find one that has a bigger range of weight. That minimum to milk. So that that one only has points. You know, 3.6 to 4.0. If you don't have any powder yet, and you're looking to say, what powder should I buy to make this round? And you can find one that has a range, say, that goes 3.4 to 4.2. That gives you a lot more play to find a load that will work best with your firearm, that will work best with, for accuracy, for recoil management, for all those things. Um, so what, what I did at first, my first card for nine millimeter tight group had 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, 3.9. And I have the COL. I, I write, wrote down all the information. So I've got the COL. I wrote down what kind of primer I used, it was CCI. Um, and I, if, if I'm using factory brass, I would have written down you know, Winchester brass. Here I wrote range brass. I just, whatever I had on the range. And then because I have a chronograph and the opportunity to use it, I measured. Once I developed this particular load, I measured the speed that it was going. So this, this load gives me 1050 to 1080 um, feet per second out of my, my gun. Uh, Robbie had a question. Yeah. So when you talked about when you were first starting out and mm -hmm. you, didn't, you didn't put enough grains and you mm -hmm. got some squib loads, were you going below the minimum recommended grains? It's possible I was because okay. you know using different different there's so many different manuals and if I were if I could find um, in these three manuals this is the only one that deals with 125 grain lead what might have happened is when I first started I only had one manual mm. and so I think what happened was I was using that one manual I was having to sort of kind of guess a little bit because I didn't have, maybe I was using the load for 124 grain when I really was using 125 grain, or something Got like that. It. I don't remember exactly. I just don't, it was like the very first load I made for the 38, and it was really embarrassing. <laughs> okay, so um, all, the, yeah. all the more uh, importance of why you need as much information as possible when it comes to Right, that. yeah, that's exactly. Um, the, the Beretta, I know that the Beretta, when the slide wouldn't reciprocate, um, I know that those were... Uh, legitimate ramp, legitimate loads um, because they would they would send the slide back just not far enough it just wasn't wasn't enough to um, you know allow the next round to be loaded from the magazine um, at, at that minimum load so yeah that, and again like I said I'm worried about that person who commented about having made 500 loads I hope they're all fine for uh, for them um, but yeah, you, you, you make mistakes, but I'd rather make a mistake not exploding my gun. <laughs> make a mistake by being too light than too heavy. Yeah, I'm, drink. I'm just curious, Robbie, also a follow-up yeah. question, because I've never seen a squib load in real mm -hmm. life. Was it particularly hard for you to have to push those bullets out of your barrel? 
to? Um, no, um, actually with um, the squib load, um, I have, I bought since that day, <laughs> but someone, it, it happened at Evans and Evans has a gunsmith. And so he brought out a, a brass rod just went, and it came right out. Oh, uh, okay. So, yeah. But now I, I have brass rods and I've helped other people with squib loads. Yeah, you just, just get a brass rod and a little something to hit it with and it'll pop right out. It, I mean, they, when it becomes a problem is, you know, the only, the expression, um, the, the two sounds you don't want, the two things you don't want to hear when you're shooting is um, a bang when you should hear nothing and nothing when you should hear a bang, right? So if you have a squib load, if you have, if you pull the trigger and you don't hear a bang, don't pull the trigger again, because then you get squib load on top of squib load on top of squib load, or worse, squib load followed by full power load. And that's when you damage the barrel. And that, that happened to a friend of mine. She, uh, she had a squib load and just kept shooting. She, got, she had no but three bullets in her barrel. Wow. Um, not, but she's not, okay. Nothing worse happened. Yeah, it was, it was a revolver and nothing. Yeah, it was a 38 revolver or 357 revolver. And she was shooting 38, so it wasn't. It didn't overwhelm the firearm. Uh, it did damage the barrel, though. She had to have the barrel replaced. So it was expensive, but, but no one was hurt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so what, like I said, what I'll do, well, so let me, let me bell a few more of these while we're talking. So what I would do is I'm going to make these measurements using that. Let me get these done so we can get on to putting some powder in. I've got my four. Ah, I just dropped it on the floor. Oh well, now we've got my three cartridges <laughs> that I'm working on. If I keep dropping them on the floor, by the time we finish, I'll only have one left. Um. So, then any questions about this particular die, though? That, um, we'll move on to weighing out some powder. So. It must be seven o'clock or thereabouts, right? Because my si my my oldest sister always calls my mom at seven o'clock. So I'm thinking that's who's on the phone. Yep, seven o'clock. Um, okay, so let's measure some powder. So let me make some room on this bench here. All right. While you're transitioning, um, yeah. Real quick, uh -huh. the uh, the dies that um, when when you purchase a set of dies, and I purchased a set of dies or several mm -hmm. sets. Do they come with all the, the deburr die? I'm sorry, the deprimer die, the case widening die, or are those separately included? Uh, separately included? If, you, if you look, um, for example, with the Lee dies, they come in a set of three. They come with the, the resizing deprimer die, the, I don't know what the proper name of the, the flaring die, if you will, and the bullet seating die. Um, the, um, word does escape, <clears throat> escape me, um, <laughs> I hate when this happens, I'm sorry. Uh, the fourth die, which is the one that's going to, um, clinch, crimp, uh, crimp thank you, that's the word. <laughs> the crimping die the, is a fourth die that you would buy separately. Uh, when you look on, um, to purchase dies, you'll see it'll see a, a set of three or a set of four. Um, you do want to make sure for pistol you get carbide dies um, because they don't require any lubrication, and lubrication is not something you want to mess with with pistol rounds. Um, before carbide dies, you'd have to lubricate to get the brass in and out of those dies. You still have to do that with rifle rounds, um, but you don't want to leave the lube on the round because then it'll get into your gun and it's. It's not a pretty sight, <laughs> trust me. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so usually they're sold in sets of three, though, for um, uh, the dies. Great, thank and you. And the Lees have been fine. RCBS makes really good dies. Um, I, I went cheap. Lees are the least expensive, and they've served me just fine um, until I went to my Dillon machine. Um, okay, so powder. Um, 
Okay, so with my tight group, now in my garage, in my real reloading workspace, I have a stand that holds this. And this is a powder dispenser. And the way it works is the powder sits in here and you do that and the powder comes out here. So I'm gonna try to replicate that here without the stand that holds it normally. Um, so bear with me, I'm gonna pour some powder in here. Now, when you put powder in one of these, you want to maintain that level to a certain extent um, because the weight of the powder down on the mechanisms influences how much powder is going to be dispensed. So don't let this get really low and don't fill it all the way to the top and then you know, just try to keep it kind of in a zone that's reasonable. Um, so what I'm going to do, I have no idea what this thing is set for. I don't remember what I last um, used it for to load. I'm gonna my scale over here. I really appreciate you guys bearing with me on all this <laughs> tricky uh, Zoom business here. So thank you. Um, so you see my scale over here. Now, first thing I did with the scale is I want to make sure it's zeroed, and it is not right now. My bench is not perfectly flat. So there's a little dial on um, at the back. Can you see that little dial on the foot? Yeah. Right there. So I can turn that and zero it so that, can you see the measuring bar here? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna do this without knocking things over. Okay, so you see that's moving up and down right there. And I want that to be centered here. So, because my table's not level, I'm going to turn this knob. You see it's, is it moving the right way? Move the wrong way. It's there kind of uh, out of the camera view, if you could move it oh. uh, towards you, towards you a little bit. There oh, you there go. We, there yeah. it is, all right. Sorry about that, okay. So, wait for this to settle. Totally. I keep going the wrong way. Okay, let's see. I think it's going down. Can you? Yes. Can you see it? Okay. All right. Yeah, I think it's going down. Yep, it's going down. All right, so I'm not going to worry about being perfect for this demonstration purposes. Just want to get it close. All right, that's close. That's pretty close. But you, that's the first step is you want to make sure you're zeroed. So now I'm going to take the, uh, the little pan. <clears throat> this is kind of interesting dispensing powder this way. All right, so when I do this step, um, when, I'm doing, when I'm first starting a session, I'll do a few just dumps, you know, I'll, And there's a pan full of powder. Oh, can you see? Ah, I just spilled it. <laughs> that doesn't work. Okay. But I'll just do a couple of dumps to sort of prime it. And then I'll uh, dump it back in. So now, I always like to do like a, one little tap up and down. Make sure you do the full range of the of the uh, thing. So now I'm going to set this for 3.8. That was my goal, right? Yeah. I think that's 3.8. I can't see it from this angle very well. So let's see where we're at with this one. I might have been doing 32s and this is going to be way off. Let's see. Okay, so that's too much, right? Can you see that? It's too high. So I would have to turn this dial and reset it for lighter load. So let me turn this a little bit. So I'm going to dump this out and try again. And again, I'm going to do a couple of throwaways in there. I 
And we're still too heavy. Okay. A lot more turning of the knob here. I won't bore you guys by doing this forever. <laughs> we'll just try one more time. Okay. Oh, pretty close. No, it's All too right. low. It's too low. Uh, okay, low, too low is okay. Yeah. Um, because, so if I was, if I was doing this to develop a load, um, from scratch, if I was doing the, the whole 3.6, 3.7, that's where this trickler comes in. This little guy, let's see. There he is. So I showed you earlier, this thing has some powder in it and there's a little knob on the back and a little nozzle on the front here. And if I turn it, eventually, some powder is going to come out. Oh, come on. All right, now I have powder in my hand. Can you see? Mm -hmm. Powder in my hand? So, can you guys see this scale okay? Yes. Okay, tell me if you see it move at all. Is it pretty steady right now? Yes. Okay, I'm just going to start turning this thing. Yeah, okay, right there, stop. All right, did we get it? <clears throat> I think a just more? a little bit, a little more. There you go. I th what does everyone else think? Looks like it's zero. Uh, I think you could take one more, one more turn. There we go, I think that's good. What do you think? That's good. Look good? <laughs> All right, we have, we have 3.8. So now I can just go ahead and pour that into my brass and I'll get my shell holder over here and I'll put it in my shell holder and there we have we have a loaded brown. So if I was doing like I said um, if I was working up a load I would set that thing to 3.6 you know, get it close, but I would make sure each round was exactly 3.6. So I would actually probably not change that setting and use the trickler, trickler to get it to 3.6 and then change it so I can get closer to 3.7 and then trickle in. I would measure every, every load on those test loads. Once I've got, you know, once I'm established and everything and I say, okay, that's 3.8, I'm going to use 3.8, I set up the powder dispenser. I'm just going to crank out powder, um, measure maybe every 10th round just to make sure things haven't, the adjustment um, hasn't changed. But it, it's the difference between working up a load for, to, to pick which load you're going to use versus just mass production of loads so you can get to the range and have a good day. So is, is, did I make sense what I was saying with that regard? Yes. Okay. So having put some powder in, the next step is going to be seating the bullets. And I want to show you something called the plunk test. So this is the barrel out of my uh, Springfield XD. And these are two bullets. These are two actual rounds that I made. And what I want to show you is, um, so one of them is my stubby little blue bullet. And the other one is a copper plated bullet from a different manufacturer. Can you see the difference? First of all, they're, they're very different lengths, right? Can you see that? The, yeah. just, the, the uh, copper plated is a longer round. Um, the, more importantly, the blue bullet has a different OG. You see how much more tapered the copper plated one is versus the, the blue one? Mm -hmm. It might not be super obvious to you guys, but you'll just maybe again have to take my word for it. So the actual shape, this, this actual shape is more um, tapered. 
this one's a little bit more um, bulbous, I guess. So what happened is I've been making this particular round for my CZs for a couple of years and with no problems, love this round, works well, everything's fine. <clears throat> I, bought this, I bought the Springfield. The first time I ran the Springfield, I kept having it not go into battery. And I was like, gosh darn it, I bought this gun, it's brand new, blah, blah, blah. Well, what was happening is it was failing the plunk test. The, that shape of that bullet, at the length it was, it wasn't able to drop all the way in to the, um, to the ri there's a, a ridge in your, right, where your chamber ends before your barrel starts where that edge of that brass sits. So one of my friends, I was telling my friend that gun doesn't work and they go, well, did you do a plunk test? I was like, no, didn't think of it. So I did the plunk test and it failed. So that's when I started using these on this gun because this one doesn't plunk test much better. So this, this one actually does pass the plunk test because I started making these a little bit shorter <laughs> just so that it would work. But I don't know, it's, 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 it's subtle, but this one plunks in. So when you're making your rounds, make sure that it passes the plunk test for your barrel, okay? That it goes oh. all, all the way into the so that the ridge where the brass ends is sitting all the way in your barrel. In so your, how did you, how did you uh, fix it uh, the other round? You had to actually shorten the brass case? Uh, I shortened the, length, the overall length. Oh, okay. By just a tiny bit, just enough so that it would. But basically what I did is I went to a different bullet <laughs> for this one. I Got didn't it. want to shorten these too much and change the way they operate my CZ. Got it, okay. So anyway, plunk, that's what a plunk test is, in case you're Very wondering. interesting. So it never comes up. Okay, so now the next step, we've got powder in our brass. So the next step is gonna be seating the bullet. So we need our bullet seating die, which uh -huh. is this one. So can you see that? Oh, you can see that. Okay, so. I put this in and then this is the stem that determines how deep the bullet is in. When you're first developing your, lo your, ro your load, take a brass that's um, take a brass and a bullet with no powder and seat it so you're going to have to, and you can use one that doesn't have a primer to save the, that um, part. So, okay. So I, I just went that, ran that down and it never even made contact. So I'm going to push this down a little more. Oh, there, I could feel that it made contact. Okay. So, I mean, right off the bat, you can see that this one is not, <laughs> keep dropping stuff anywhere near as long, as short as the finished round, right? You can see the difference. Mm -hmm. So now here's another thing you need. Calipers. Um, you can get the, these come in a variety of quality for, you don't need the top quality one for re reloading. You need a top quality one for like when I, I had this one for reloading and I took a class on make, making a barrel for 1911, I had to get a better one. This one wasn't good enough for the measurements I needed to do for a barrel, but it's plenty good. So you don't have to get a $100 one. You can get, you know, a $30 one. Um, so if you remember, we want 1.25, right? And now I can't remember which one it was. All right. So to measure this, see where we're at. Okay, so this one is measuring 1.75. So we're a long ways off yet, right? Because we want 1.125. Is that is that the number? Where's my? Yeah. Draw. Okay. 1.125. Okay, so I'm gonna crank this down a little more. Again. So now I'm at one point. 
1.35. So let me show you that so you can see. And if you've ever never read one of these things, there's there's a scale on the bottom over here. Over here's where you where you see that it's. Oh boy. Can you see that? Oh, I'm sorry, guys. Again. Yeah. Right yeah. there is where it says one. And then over here's the three five. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So on the scale, it says one point one, and then three five on the dial. Right. Exactly. So we want two five, so we got to go a little more. That was probably too much. Let's see. I keep dropping things. All right, so this one. All right, so now we're at 1.127. 1 Tiny bit more. And I'm at 1.124. So pretty good. Pretty close. And if you measure every single round, there's going to be a variation of about like, you know, anything between 1.123 and 1.127, I'll be happy with for this kind of load. Again, I'm not doing precision rifle, 100 yard, need to hit a, you know, dime kind of load. I'm doing a, a range load for my pistol. Um, now, what I have now is a load with no powder in it, right? Is my demo one. So <clears throat> this, whenever you make a round and it's something's wrong with it, then you use this thing. And I can't use it because you need a concrete floor, but you, you put the round in this little holder. It looks like a hammer. And then you beat the kajibis out of it. And it's, it's what they call an, oh, that's pretty loud. It's an inertial, um, it, it'll, the bullet will come out from inertia. But you have to hit it on concrete, um, something really hard. So I'll save that for when I go back out in the garage later. <laughs> so, but that's how you take a part around. Um, okay, so now, so now that we've got this set where we want it, um, we can make one with the, we got the powder, We've got the bullet, got the ram. And I want to make a good, you know, every time I draw that ram, I want to make sure I draw that all the way. And let's see, check the measure on this one. And it's 1 1.1, 2, three and a half. <laughs> so, so there we have, we're almost done. We now have a bullet powder primer. It all looks great, right? Looking mm -hmm. good. All right. What's the last step? The crimping. Why do we crimp? Uh, in, a, in a pistol round, a semi-automatic pistol round, all your rounds are sitting in the magazine. And every time you shoot the gun and you get the whole thing with the slide reciprocating, the bullets going out, all that, the rounds in the magazine are, because they're a different length, they don't all fit completely across the magazine. As you saw, I had that um, plated round was a little bit longer. So, so they're sitting in the magazine going, get it, get it, get it. Well, that's kind of like this. It's kind of like this. If you don't, um, remember we belled out that, that brass. If we don't taper it back in, the bullets kind of loosen there and they can actually, bullet can come out of the, the brass. In revolvers, it's even more important. And revolvers, when you crimp, you actually crimp them in like this with semi-automatic, we call it a taper crimp. With um, revolver, it's a full like crimp. And you'll even see, um, and of course I dropped everything already. Uh, this this little guy here, this little wad cutter from a, it's a 32 wad cutter. Can you see the ridges? Yeah. So this is a revolver, bullet for a revolver round. And those ridges are so that the crimp, when you crimp die, that's where the crimp is supposed to go into the ridges and hold mm. that bullet firm. Because it's a real problem in revolver rounds if you don't crimp them. 
tight. With the Samato, like I said, it's just a taper crimp. Um, most of the bullet seating dies can be adjusted to taper at the same time. Um, so you could do it that way. I, I choose to do it as a separate step. Um, it's just part of my, I guess, how I was brought up by my rifle shooting friend to do everything separately. Um, so um, if you read the instructions on the Lee, wherever that went, went flying, <laughs> the, the instructions tell you how to adjust it to taper at the same time as you seat the bullet. And it has to do with how far you adjust this part in versus this. So you, you'd you seat this farther in to taper it and then make the adjustments on the bullet seat to compensate for, for that um, adjustment. Um, so where is it? Well, here's some of these. So there's all the instructions. So it, it tells you exactly how to do that, but I don't do it. That way. So tapering die, and something else fell on the floor. Every time I pick something up, I drop something else. So the tapering die goes in and my new round. And you'll feel, you'll be able to feel the flare on the on the brass before it goes into the die and then when you set it in and you'll actually feel and see this is the thing if we were in person you, you would each gotten a chance to feel these things you'll feel a little bit of that and say, oh, that's, not enough. that's better okay <laughs> so you can feel when it's and all, all you're doing is taking that little flare out and pressing it against the bullet so that it's, it's holding the bullet more tightly in there. Mm -hmm. So let me talk to you for a couple minutes. Do you have any questions about that before I go on? Once you've crimped the, uh, the bullet, um, and, I, and I kind of understand the two steps now, um, if you use the, the bullet uh, seating die and the crimping, you probably wouldn't be able to um, power out the uh, uh, the projectile, correct? To take like to use this, you mean? You talking about using this? Yes. Well, once you crimp, um, I have been successful in taking apart a crimped um, semi-auto round. I can't do that with a revolver round ever, um, but it's a lot harder. So. That's part of, part of the reason why I prefer to do them separate. I also just feel like when I'm adjusting two different things, and especially because, again, going back to my own history of reloading, I always, from, from day one, was reloading multiple different rounds, mm -hmm. uh, 30, you know, revolver 38 and the 9 millimeter to start. Um, so I was switching back and forth all the time between the two. And every time you take the die out and put it back in, you have to check those adjustments. It was easier for me to just have to make a one adjustment to the bullet seat, which once you've adjusted these and, um, you know, it pretty, it's pretty close. Um, I don't, you don't have to make a lot of gross adjustments, but, um, but every time you take it out, you just make a little adjustment. And so it was easier for me to just not have to deal with those two different adjustments, um, but just adjust it once and then the other one and do it that way. Um, that was just how it was best for me. But certainly, many, many people do the crimping and the bullet seating in the same step. Uh, that makes sense. It, you know, especially starting out, I, I want to be um, cognizant of every step I make. Yeah, and, and if you're using a, a progressive, it kind of, it's not really separate steps. It's all, every time you press the handle, it's just which dies you choose to sit on your machine. Right. Uh, so, uh, so let's talk for a few minutes about uh, developing your load. So in our theoretical nine millimeter load that we're doing today, so we made some at 3.6, we made some at 3.7, 3.8. So now you're gonna take them to the range. Um, you wanna set up at a, a reasonable distance. Um, I'll usually do seven yards because that's kind of my normal, you know, self-defense practice distance. And and I'll fire them 
you know, first I'll, I'll warm up myself and the gun with the fact reload or one of my old reloads or whatever, so that my very first round of the day isn't a test on a, a new load that I'm working up. Um, and then I'll just fire the five rounds. Um, what I'll do is I will mark each round that I've made with a Sharpie. Um, I'll either mark them one, two, three, four, five, or I'll actually put the weight of the powder, you know, 3.8, 3.6, 3.0, whatever. Um, I used to just put them in the box in a certain order until that one day that I dropped the box. Uh, and, they all went, and I didn't know which one was which. Um, so I started marking them with a Sharpie. And um, I'll have a piece of paper in the box with them, you know, just listing those different loads. And then when I go, I'll shoot the targets and I'll see which ones are giving me the most accurate, um, uh, you know, most, I, I'm looking for the least uh, discomfort with the maximum accuracy. So I might get more accuracy from a bullet going a little faster, but then the recoil is getting a little more than I want to play with. So, you know, so you're, you're, whatever your, your goal is, um, you want to make sure that there's not overpressure. Overpressure is usually seen, you're going to look for that in the, in the, um, in the primer pocket. So you see how there's a nice, um, what's the word I want? The donut around, between the primer and the brass itself, you see there's a nice donut of space mm -hmm. ring around the primer. There's a, there's space between the primer and the brass. Can you see that? Yeah. A little black space, a little bit, you know, um, blank space or, 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 if the load is too powerful, if it's over, over pressured, that primer is going to get flattened and pushed outward. And so you'll actually see it impeding on that space. Um, when it's really bad and, and you can uh, Google this to see you know, over pressure, uh, you know, Overpressure rounds, primer pockets, whatever, to see pictures of, of what it looks like. But what will happen is that primer will be uh, expand beyond, and it's really bad, it'll actually expand beyond the pocket completely, but you'll see it expand into the pocket and take up that space so it's a lot flat, more flattened out. That's a bad sign, you don't want that. If you see that, stop, don't shoot any more rounds. That load's too hot. Um, if you have access to a chronograph um, and you need to go to an outdoor range to use it. Um, so one of the things when I was developing my favorite round for my CZs was I don't compete, but every once in a blue moon, my best friend who does compete talks me into going to a competition just for the heck of it. And I know that I need a power factor. Have you heard of power factors in competition shooting? It's um, they have a minimum standard for, um, you can't be shooting little powder puff rounds. So a power factor is the weight of the bullet times the speed, excuse me, times the speed, and then divided by a thousand or whatever. So for my 125 grains uh, bullets, I need to go a thousand feet per second to make the 125, which is the minimum power factor for a nine millimeter uh, firearm. So my rounds, if you saw my card, they chronograph around 1050 to 1080. So as much as I'd rather shoot a round that was a little softer than that, that's the round I picked for myself so that when I do once a year go to a competition, I'm not suddenly confronted with having to shoot a higher, um, a stronger round than I'm normally shooting at, at, the, at the range. So, you know, if you're shooting a, a round and your book is telling you that at maximum speed should be you know, 1100 and your things coming out of the chronograph at 1300. It's like, well, wait a minute, that's too powerful. You need to back way off on that one. Uh, so that's another way to measure um, how your round is, is looking. Uh, of course, taking into account that different length barrels and, and those sorts of things will affect the, the speed. Uh, any questions about developing a round, developing a load for yourself? So it sounds like a chronograph is definitely a necessity to have them. Uh, I was able to manage without a chronograph for the first first year because I started reloading in April of 16 and I got a chronograph as a birthday gift in 17. So I managed to go without a chronograph for a while, but, but I was keeping my loads, you know, like I said, I was being very conservative with my loads 
because I didn't have a chronograph. Um, and God. my rifle shooting friend who taught me was the one who gave me the chronograph. He said, you need a chronograph, Robbie. What do you mean you don't have a chronograph yet? Here, he gave me a chronograph. Um, you know, it was very important for him with his rifle rounds that he, chron he chronographs every single round. Yeah. Until his wife put a pistol round through his chronograph. <laughs> Posted that on Facebook. <laughs> she shot his chronograph. He'd had it for 20 years. <laughs> she shot it. Oh, no. <laughs> well, it's time to get a new one. Yeah, she had to go get him a new one for... Uh, not a new wife, a new chronograph. <laughs> no, not a new wife. Not, yeah, a new chronograph. <laughs> she put it on Facebook, poor thing. She, she admitted they, it. They sound expensive, too, the chronographs. Uh, actually, the chronographs are um, not that expensive. Eighty, I think $80. Oh, for, okay. Uh, oh, that's not bad at all. Yeah. yeah. Just don't shoot it. Um, as long as you don't hit it with your, your round, um, <laughs> they're, they're fine. Or you find someone who has one and you borrow it. So that's another way to go about it. Um, let me show you the progressive press. I know you guys are all waiting for that, right? Especially Calvin and Michael, because they have theirs yeah. now. Yes, sir. Well, I, I should point out, I, I didn't show you this, guys, but I, I have my presses in this little bracket here. I bought that. I, I built this um, reloading table just for, it's, it's a, uh, um, it's a Black & Decker Workmate 225 is the base. And then I, um, I took a piece of plywood. I can't see the plywood, but there's, it's a, I got a plywood. I put a um, two by four, screwed it to the center, clamped that into the Workmate, and then uh, got this bracket from a company called Inline Fabrication. I love them. They make all sorts of little accessories for presses. And uh, because I have both the single stage and the progressive um, on my, my real workbench, which is actually also a workmate, but a much older one, um, I have this bracket. So just, can you see the bracket? This press comes out and I'll put it down somewhere. And here comes my progressive. Uh, it's heavier. <laughs> and then my progressive goes in the same slot. And now I have my progressive there. So that's kind of a nifty deal. So say hello to my friend. Okay, so this is this particular press is the Dylan Square Deal B. It's the littlest one, and for pistol rounds only, it's absolutely the bomb. But you can't do rifle rounds on it. You can't do um, uh, anything that's got a neck. You can only do straight wall. So I'm trying to clear off the space so I can see. So the powder up here and on mine, when I, I'm moving this so you can see it. I put on here what, I'm on this blue tape, it's one of these pieces that says tight group. So I know what powder's in here. There's my powder tight group. And this one says, this is for the 125 grain blue bullet. So I know this is set up for that particular um, uh, volume to dispense. Then if I change the settings, I know to change that. Um, this particular one, so the ones that the fellows have use the full size dies like this, like we were using earlier. This particular press, again, zooming around, uh, has these little tiny dies that are special just for this press. So you have to buy those proprietary dies to go with this press run about a hundred dollars, about twice as much as the regular ones. Um, let's see. So I'll just show you the turntable part. Let's do this. Uh, did I lose you guys? Uh oh. Your yeah your camera your, vi your video cut off. out? No, you're still okay. on with us but you turned off your video. Oh, okay. Now I got to figure out how to turn my video back on. 
Huh. Let me see if I can do it. I just asked you to start video, so you, there it is. Oh, there we go. Okay, I found it. Sorry, guys. All right. So I'll try to do that again. So if you look here, this is the turn helmet. So I'm going to run the handle. What do you stuck on? Hang on a second. It's stuck on something. Oh, I see. It's stuck. There we go. Okay. So every time you move this, let's try the same. Can you see it from here? I can't see what I'm pointing at right now. There we go. Can you see it? Yeah. You see how it turns? Oh, okay. That's cool. Mm, nifty. Well, um, there's two types of progressive. There's one that's called auto indexing, um, which is what this one does. So every time you pull the handle, it turns. And there's another kind that you have to turn manually. Um, and that's one of those, uh, you know, Glock versus, you know, whatever the, you know, it's, it's one of those things like, oh, you're either a fan of auto indexing or you're a fan of, of manual indexing. Um, I don't know what, uh, what the fellas, what Michael and Kelvin's um, do. Uh, I know that the 550 is a manual indexing machine. And I know this one's an auto indexing. But what happens, let's get some. So if I put a, let's see. So see the brass there? Mm -hmm. See the brass, there's a brass in here now. I, so you, you load a brass in the first slot, okay? Can you see that? There's a brass right there. All right, so I pull the handle, I'm going to deprime it and move it to the next slot. And then you push forward to prime it and uh, I'm actually going to replace this one with one that still has a primer in it because I don't have any primers loaded in, in this machine. And I'll dump my primer out. All right. So this is why I was saying you can use it like a single stage by pulling, you know, you could just do the deprimer and then pull it out and do another one and do another one without going to the next steps. So now it's going to load the powder. Then this next step, we'll put the bullet in, and it'll pull it, and then it'll crimp it, and it'll dump it out. And I have my completed round. Wow, that's awesome. So that's how, that's how that works. So imagine if you're doing this for real, you load one piece in here, and you pull the handle, and it moves, and then you put another one in, and you pull the handle, now there's two on there, you put one more, now you have three, four. There's always one in each position, you have four, one in each stage going, and every time you pull the handle, you load a bullet, you load a brass, and a bolt's coming out the other end. So, yeah. So just, yeah, so from a time standpoint, when I'm using a single stage press to make 50 rounds, I would guesstimate I'm talking about an hour and a quarter to an hour and a half to make 50 rounds on my single stage. If I'm being very careful and, you know, but, but not, not going super careful, but, you know, being careful. Uh, this thing I can crank out. And I know they say, I think they say on the website 300 or something. But I, I can get 200 rounds in an hour out of this versus an hour and a half for 50. So considerably faster. <laughs> And I think with a 750, I think that thing is rated for like 600 rounds an hour or something. Whoa. Something Come on, flying. Calvin. Come on, Calvin. Let me see those 600 rounds. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but again, um, when I'm doing this, so, and just like with the single stage, this is already set up. I don't have to worry about read, you know, checking my length, checking the, the bullet seating length. You know, the, I still check the powder. So when I first pull this out, you know, set it up to go, I'll put a round in um, like I did here that's got a primer still in it. And I'll just crank through a couple of, you know, weigh those powder measures for those first three, just to check that in the month since I last used it, things didn't go cattywampus. Um, 
and I'll, the first couple rounds, I'll measure the length, make sure that the length, it shouldn't, I can't imagine why it would, it's just I was drilled to be so careful by my, my rifle buddy that I do these things. And then once I'm happy that those things are still set up the way I had set them up, I'll just go away, you know, crank away. And uh, I might check the powder charge every 20 or 25 rounds. Again, just some people never check the powder charge. They say it's set, it's fine, and they go and go and go. I, I still feel like I should check the powder charge periodically. And I have made slight adjustments after rechecking. Well, oh, I'm off by about 0.1. I, I don't want to be that far off. I'll make adjustments. But yeah, you can just crank away pretty much after that. And the, the powder is measured, it's measured through the progressive. It's already measured. So you can just dump a bunch of powder in there or how does that work? Right, so the powder, here's the powder up in here. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the dial. It doesn't, it doesn't come with a, a cute little dial. It comes with just a thing with a wrench. You have to use a wrench to turn. I bought this on eBay for like $5 replace you know just sits on top of the nut that's there but just a little dial and um inside here get a different view of it and this is the powder measure and it um let's see i'll, I'll put a, it it will only do it if there's an actual piece of brass in there so let me throw a piece of brass in there again just so you can see it doing its thing so <laughs> a little trouble. There we go. Okay. If there's, if it doesn't, if it doesn't detect a brass when you're um, pulling the handle, the powder, powder feeder won't dump powder, so powder won't fall on the floor. So you're looking. Watch this part right here. See it go? Yeah. That was, that was the, that was the powder getting dispensed. That, the the powder measures in the middle there, and when it went forward the powder dropped straight down into where the uh the cartridge was and um, so, so we, we wouldn't necessarily I, need a scale if we have yeah. one yeah um so you know i have the balance scale i also have so we can we can try it on this one i have this little electric one as well that i got so let's see. Let's see what powder measure I got out of that. So, so this is a cute little electric thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's gonna turn up. Okay, I put the train here. Okay, I'm gonna pour. Put the powder in there. Uh, what does it say? Can you read it? Mm -hmm. Oh, it went away. Three. I'm, I'm reading three point nine on it. So again, you're gonna have to take my word for it, guys. It says three point nine. So. so you can use something like this where you can get the, the scale. If, if you buy a, a package, usually it comes with some kind of scale. Um, but yeah, you're measuring grains. Uh, just to give you an idea of how much a grain is, a pound of powder is 7,000 grains. And so if I'm using about a little over three and a half grains, I'm gonna get about not quite 2,000 rounds out of a pound of powder. And a pound of powder costs 30, say 30, 32 dollars maybe. So I'm not even gonna try to do the math at this late hour <laughs> in my <laughs> head. But you'll have to take my word for it again that uh, that's not so bad. No, not at all, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the progressive, certainly the progressive, if you're, if you're gonna do it, invest in the progressive. And um, I love my Dylan. Um, Dylans are very popular. And uh, I won't tell you what to buy. And I know some of you have already bought. So I'm not going to tell you. Dylan. But um, the Dylans have a very good reputation. So. Also, we, we are part of LA Progressive Shooters. So it makes sense that you have oh, progressive. Oh, so you should have a progressive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, yeah, now, sad to say, for the same reason that ammo is hard to come by right now, components are hard to come by right now. Uh, I bought 3,600 3, rounds of, of the blue bullets, and it took two months to get them. The price, was, the price hadn't gone up. It was just the lag time was, was terrible. I had to wait to it because they, and they said, you know, just due to COVID uh, and demand, it's, we're back ordered. Primers have gone way up in price where I used to pay. Now I haven't bought primers since COVID because I had a whole stockpile already. Um, but my friend tells me that when you can find primers where they used to be two or three cents a piece, you're now paying closer to 10 cents a piece for primers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. I haven't talked to anybody about powder as far as availability of powder is concerned and our prices. And I get brass, pick it up at the range. So that's easy. <laughs> so if you're thinking of starting reloading, definitely start saving brass now. <clears throat> Just because um, when you, when you want to start reloading, you want to already have your brass already, you know, you won't, you won't be sorry if you have a huge box. I have a friend who reloads. He's got um, Home Depot, those orange buckets you get at Home Depot, full of brass for each of the calibers he does. It's a lot of brass. <laughs> so you just pick them up and put them in, in like just in, pla in a plastic bag? Yeah, um, I, when I go to the range, I have a little mesh bag that I use. Um, okay. I bought I bought a pack of three cheap mesh bags on Amazon for, I don't know, a few dollars. Mm -hmm. And that one's red, one's blue, one's green. And I personally have color coded my nine millimeters are red and my 38s are blue and my 32s are green. So I, I try to remember to use those different bags for those different um, brasses when I pick them up or save them for my own. One good thing about revolvers, it's really easy to save your brass <laughs> when you shoot revolvers because you just dump them out in your hand and save them. Um, but yeah, just, just pick them up. Uh, you can use anything, a plastic bag. Just make sure they're not too hot. You don't want to melt the bag because they're, they're hot right after they come out of the gun. Um, and you can, if you pick them up at the, at the outdoor range and they're really, really dirty, this is the reason I chose to go with a mesh bag. I'll take the mesh bag and I'll just dump it in a bucket of water to wash off the, the gross dirt. And then I'll set them aside till, you know, give them a, a couple of weeks to dry, you know, just throw them out on a piece of newspaper or something, and before I then put them in the in the uh, the tumbler to dry, the, the drying tumbler. Um, so, what else can we say? Um, let's do questions and answers. Any topic that we started, I think I've, I I kind of covered the basics. I think um, sort of showed you what's going on at least. Um, Sorry we couldn't do this in person. So you could actually feel the what it feels like. Uh, I'll throw another one more thing in. Um, this is a stuff called one shot. It's a dry loop. Um, and what I'll do with my brass is I, I you saw my kitty earlier. Um, I have these jugs of cat treats that my mother feeds my cats. I can't get her to stop. And so <laughs> I keep I got lots of them, so I have my brass in those, and I'll just spray this into there and jumble it around um, and just get a little bit of this dry lube. It just makes it go in and out of the, the dyes uh, a little bit easier, especially the, the first dye, the resizing dye can be kind of sticky going in and out. You don't want to use the, the kind of lube that you would use on a rifle cartridge. So that wet, that's a kind of a wet lube that you have to wipe off when you're done. And um, it's not something you want to be messing with. It's just makes things more complicated, but the dry lube is fine to use. So anybody have any questions? I just want to say thank you for your time and knowledge. That was very uh, comprehensive and uh, you broke it down really well. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I tried, this is my, again, my first time uh, uh, with teaching this topic, um, but I've been doing it myself for a while now. Um, yeah, my, my best recommendation is to, if you, ca if you can get the opportunity to take the class at Angeles, if, if you seriously want to do reloading, and especially if you're going to do rifle, that two day class at Angeles is awesome because he's got decades of experience and he's got examples of all the things that can go wrong and samples of like blown apart guns and things like that. Um, it is a great class. And if you take that class, you get a discount at the shooting at the Angeles reloading store that weekend when you're there for the class. 
to um, buy equipment or materials or whatever. Um, you can buy reloaders on the internet. Uh, you can buy an Angelus um, reloading store if they have inventory. I'd call before I drove all the way up there to see if they have what you wanted. Um, for components, another location is a place called Phillips Wholesale in Covina. Um, they sell powder and primers and things. They're only open, I, want, I don't know if it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Thursday, Friday, Saturday. they only open a few days a week and uh, they get pretty busy. I, I, I was shocked when I went there. I thought, oh, it's a wholesale place it's out in the middle of nowhere and uh, there was a line out the door. And that was before COVID. So um, I checked their website because they'll, they'll list what powders they have available and so forth. Um, uh, you can buy powder and primers online if you can find them. Again, like if you go to a, you know, Midway USA or Brownells or whatever, you know, out of stock, out of stock, out of stock. Um, but if you can find them, you do have to pay a hazmat fee for powder and primers. So if you can find them at a local store, you're, you're better off because the hazmat fee is pretty expensive. I, I want to say $15 extra on top of the ship, on top of the regular shipping you're already paying. Um, I'm trying to think where else I've seen um, reloading supplies. There's a place in, um, oh, what's it called? There's a place in Orange. Uh, I can't remember the name. Oh. <laughs> I hate when I do that. Um, I want to say Foot Locker, but it's not. Huh? It's not Fowler's, is it? Fowler's, thank you. <laughs> Fowler's um, has some reloading supplies. And uh, uh, yeah, mo mostly I bought mine at, at uh, Angelus. That's where I've gotten most of mine. I've, I've gotten some at Phillips. And I sometimes, and I, I haven't seen this offer in all year since COVID. Um, sometimes Midway USA will have a hazmat free, you know, no, no hazmat fee shipping um, deal. But I think they don't need to offer that because they're sold out of everything anyway. <laughs> Um, I would say the first thing any of you should buy, if you don't already have, have it, is get a reloading manual. Um, again, going back to, so like, you know, the Lee again, um, because the first part of the book is, you know, what we were talking about today, safety rules, and this is all how to do it instructions um so page after page lots of that before you ever get to the tables um so a, a good reloading manual is a good place to start and then you can you can look up before you buy your if you don't have any powder already you can kind of start to figure out which powders it's it's good to have a couple of different powders um and work up loads so for example i have tight group as my number one choice for nine millimeter but I've also, I use HP 38 for my 38 calibers, but I also worked up loads for my nine millimeters using the HP 38. If I ever can't find tight group, but I have HP 38 in my trunk, then I can load my nine millimeter for that. So, um, and the, the most powders are sold by the pound, four pounds, eight pound um, containers. And like I said, I can make almost 2000 rounds of nine millimeter from a pound, so. Um, you don't need to go buy eight pounds to start with. Get a pound, work up loads with that one, see if you're happy with it. Um, this one, unique, um, is one of the kind of tried and trues. Um, it's sort of an, it's been around forever. It's an old, like the old timer reloaders were using unique 50 years ago, whatever. It's kind of dirty though. So you might, you know, everybody says use unique. Okay, I got some unique. And my gun is incredibly dirty now, so um, so I don't don't commit to any one powder right off the bat. Pick one or two um, or three, and uh, you know, and work up some loads for your different things. Bullet weight. Um, if you're already shooting a manufactured bullet of a certain weight that you're happy with, if if you're shooting nine millimeter and you're shooting 115 grain and you're happy with that, start with 115 grain. Um, I had heard that CZs really like 124 grain, so that's why I use 125, because that's close enough. 
Um, but that's why I, I make that round instead of 115 grain round for my gun. Um, what, what, what kind of, you guys are all nine millimeter shooters or are you thinking about shoot, loading other kinds of, of uh, rounds? I shoot 45 and 40. 45 and 40? Yeah. And for Colin? me, oh, nine for now. I have right. a lot. <laughs> yeah. All nine. Yeah, so um, the, I, I find the copper plated bullets to be just fine. You don't need to buy full metal jacket for reloading because the whole point, like I said at the beginning, was so you can shoot more by paying less for, per round. And uh, I, th I made the mistake when I first started, the first box of bullets I bought were Hornady um, hollow points. And I've never used them <laughs> because almost immediately I found out, oh, these things are really expensive and these other things are much cheaper. I still have uh, several boxes of Hornady hollow points and I've never used them for reloading. <laughs> Just sitting in my trunk, waiting for the day that I might run out of other stuff and have to use them. Um, Sometimes you have to adapt. You just can't find a perfect match on the tables for what you have. Um, so sometimes you have to kind of, uh, you know, tweak the numbers. Um, so for example, um, with the plated bullets, there, the Lee has actually some plated bullet data for the loading table, but with a very limited um, choice of powders. So I couldn't find plated bullet for tight group um, data. Then the plated bullet manufacturers say, use a, use a, the high end of lead or the low end of full metal jacket. So they're, they're telling you, so when we were looking at the table, we had 3.6 to 4.0 for the lead bullet. What the plated bullet people are telling you is use the high end of that. So maybe I would have started that load. And again, abundance of caution, I probably would have started at 3.8, um, 3.9 and okay, full metal jacket, 4.4 is the maximum. Okay, I'll, I'll go up to 4.1 and work that load and see where that goes. Um, so sometimes you have to do that kind of thing. You just can't find your bullet with your powder. But the internet is a wonderful thing. Um, uh, you know, be cautious if someone's just telling you, you know, like, oh, well, John on the, you know, Glock discussion group said, oh, yeah, I use this, you know, load. You know, who's John? <laughs> can you trust John? I don't know. But, but you can, you know, you, you put it out there, hey, I need reload data for a particular combination. And there's someone else who's already been making that load and they will tell you what, what to do or at least give you a starting point to, to work from. And, and watch, you can watch lots of YouTube videos. I, th I think my only problem with YouTube videos is they never show you what can go wrong or tell you about like why, you know, they, they don't seem very cautious. They, they kind of go, okay, here's how you do it. Bam, 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 bam. And it seems so easy and, and they don't tell you about things like primers or explosives. Be careful with your primers, <laughs> things like yeah. that. So um, any questions? This is a great intro and it's like you can really go down the rabbit hole into this whole other different <laughs> world of reloading. It's yeah. true. It is a, it is yeah, a rabbit awesome. hole. Um, yeah, and, and like I said, I, I wish we could have done this in person so you guys could have actually experienced it. But I hope that, um, you know, by talking to you today that at least I've shown you what you would be getting into. And I, I really enjoy it. It just adds another level for me to the shooting. Um, it's like a photographer who develops your own film, you know, it's fun to take pictures, but it, you know, if, if you're into that, you know, also like to do the development. This is sort of that, that fun for me is making the bullets and going to the, making the rounds and going to the range and, and shooting them. And, you know, I just, it just makes it a little bit more pleasurable for me. And um, I get to shoot more because I save right. them. And also on the, be more self-sufficient, right? And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly, well, you know, if, um, you know, luckily I had a pretty good stockpile of, of primers before COVID hit. Um, so I have, I have plenty of primers. Uh, I can 
I can uh, make bullets for another couple of years before I'll run out of stuff. Okay. Don't don't tell us where you live. <laughs> <laughs> I did have to buy bullets. Though. I ran. Out, I wasn't didn't run out of, but I was running low on bullets, so I didn't have to buy bullets. But luckily, I have lots of primers. Um, I'll just mention. Speaking of primers, um, when you buy primers, try not to buy. There are two kinds you want to don't need to buy. Don't buy match grade primers unless you're forced to because there's nothing else available. Just because unless your match grade primers are for like high precision competition shooting, you know, they're more expensive because they're more consistent. Um, but why spend the money if you don't have to? And then also kind of avoid anything that's sort of like, I don't know, off brand, if you will, <laughs> primers. Because if the primers don't work, then nothing works. Um, the four biggies are, are CCI, Remington, Winchester, and Federal. And you'll hear people talk about them being hard or soft. Um, if you have a gun like mine, where I've worked the trigger, so I have a fairly light trigger on my, my CZ versus factory, um, you want a softer primer if you can, because the firing pin isn't hitting as hard because I've got the, the trigger at you know, seven pounds double action and maybe three pounds single action versus the factory 12 pounds and six pounds. So um, Federal is supposed to be the softest um, primer and CCI of those four is the hardest primer. Um, but uh, I haven't, I, I haven't had problem with the CCI in my, my nine millimeters. I have had problems with CCI in my revolvers that I've also done trigger jobs on that a little bit lighter than factory. Um, so I, I always load federal on my revolver rounds just because I, I have had primer strikes that don't go off. What were the brands again? CCI, Federal, Remington, and what's the fourth one? Uh, Winchester. Winchester. Yeah. And, and I think in order of softest to hardest, it's Federal, Winchester, Remington, CCI. I believe that's correct. Remington and Winchester are kind of between there. But if you're if you're shooting a Glock or a factory, you know, relatively factory trigger on a Glock, hardness won't matter. Um, it's only when you start messing around like I do with my triggers, putting you know outside parts in and things. Um, that should be your next class: is showing us tr how to do trigger work, <laughs> trigger modifications. But, oh, right? I can only do that on Berettas and CZs, so uh, <laughs> it would only work for people with those two guns. I don't know how to do it with Glocks. I'll have to learn. I'll have to get a Glock and then do it, and then I can teach other people how to do it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, um, get yourself a good reloading. You can still buy these. I think they're still available. Get yourself a good reloading manual. Start with that. Um, watch videos. Read, read as much as you can about it. Um, and then when you're ready, just take it slow. Be careful. Probably the single biggest mistake you can make reloading is double priming. Of course, not a problem on a progressive. Shouldn't be a problem if you're doing it carefully on single stage, but that's where after I've filled, so when I'm using the single stage, and if you recall, I, I said after I put the powder and I put it in the rack, so I've got this rack full of uh, 50 rounds of, of brass full of powder. Before I go to put bullets in there, I take a flashlight and I just go over and just make sure they all have the same amount of powder in them roughly. That, you know, it, it's obvious when you've double loaded, you know, there's twice as much powder, you'll see it. Um, so you want to just, that's, the, that's where the, the worst thing that can happen is if you double load the powder, you see the bullet, you shoot that out of your gun and you're doing, you're going to blow up your gun. You're going to really damage your gun badly. And hopefully not yourself, but possibly your hand too. So mm -hmm. that's, the thing, the most, the most important thing is be careful about is one one charge per per round. So have a system. So for me, I, I I have the rack over here. I've got my powder measure over here. I dump powder in the rack. Dump powder in the rack. Dump powder in the rack. I don't put anything. You know, I've got the unpowdered rounds in a, one of these little, you know, one of these little things here sitting by the the powder dispenser because they don't have to be upright and then in the rack and then once they're all in the rack with the flashlight I check and then I set the bullets in them and then one time uh, seat the bullets in the press. 
Oh. So that, that's where you have to be the most especially careful so on that powder. And when you're doing single stage, when you're doing the powder, even with the double stage, like I said, I'll still check the powder loads periodically, just make sure they're not drifting too far off where I want it to be. Because it's just, I work so hard to develop a load, I don't want to be loading 4.0 when I meant to do 3.8. So, and don't mix your powders. Pick one. Like I said, I, I have tape on here to tell me what powder is in here so I don't make a mistake and think I'm loading something else. Awesome. Anybody else have any uh, final questions for Robbie? Especially Calvin and Michael who actually have <laughs> their reload. reload I'm right looking now. forward for that uh, trigger session. <laughs> what kind of gun do you have? Oh, I have CZ. Oh, you have a CZ? Yeah, oh, okay. SP, so <laughs> I have a student. Trigger work for the yeah. CZ. Yeah, I'm looking forward on that. <laughs> like I said, um, I think it was, is it, which one of you asked me to uh, help you with your, you, you had the, the 750 count or was it Michael? Who had the 750? You, no. Yeah, so um, if you want to arrange a private session with me, working on your reloader, we can make that arrangement. Um, but I would like to wait with COVID being kind of ravaging right now. And my mom is 90, I live with my mom where she lives with me and she's 91. I'm trying to be a little bit of special careful not to get out and about too much um, for right now. So absolutely. Let's yeah. wait till yeah. January before we see how things are going before we plan any in-person meetings. Um, okay, guys, I guess that's, uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions later. You know, if, if two months from now you're thinking, hey, I think I'm going to buy a reloader. Robbie, what do you think? Should I get the 750 or the 550? You know, or what powders do you like or anything? Any questions you have about anything, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to share information. I, I, I love teaching and I love sharing. And um, so just anytime, you know, as long as you don't wake me up, <laughs> don't, don't call me and wake me up. But Send me a text or, uh, or reach out to me on the on Facebook or whatever, and uh, I'll be happy to help as best I can. So awesome! I also yeah. want to thank uh, Igor for making yes. this session possible using your Zoom account, so that we didn't, wouldn't you. have any time limits. Thank you so much, Igor. Thank, 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 thank you. you. Work. Yeah, couldn't have done this without you. Absolutely. So who's going to come over and put all the stuff back in my garage now? Oh, I guess it's me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll come over after COVID. <laughs> there are some things more important than COVID. This nah, stuff's heavy. Nah, nah, nah. Oh. Actually, no, I, I didn't have to throw it in my car and drive it somewhere else. So that, you know, it's only, only back to my garage. It's not so bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, when it's safe again, we're definitely going to have to come and treat you to a, a lunch or dinner, folks. Okay. Get, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, when it's safe again, we'll, we'll get together and you guys can play with my press. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. I made, I made this portable press table just for, for teaching with. So. Got to try it out sometime in public. <laughs> well, maybe I, I, I don't normally make uh, cartridges in the living room, so I don't know that my mom would enjoy me doing that. <laughs> oh, a quick, uh, uh, I don't think I mentioned this in the safety part. Don't vacuum powder. Oh. If you don't use powder, <laughs> don't use a vacuum because it might burn your vacuum into a cinder. <laughs> so That's if you spill enough. powder, use a broom. Don't use a vacuum. So don't do it on the carpet. <laughs> but like I said, once you sweep it up, just throw it out in your garden. It's great fertilizer. Don't if you're sweeping it up off the floor, don't put it back in the. You know, don't don't try to reuse it, because think about how tiny amounts that we were talking about, those little individual grains, were making the difference between 3.1 and 3.2, and so forth. So a little bit of dust off the ground or a little bit of dirt is going to change your your powder measure uh, for that load. So just toss it it's not worth it's not worth messing up your rounds um sources for bullets like i said the same stores you can order bullets online and there's no hazmat fee for bullets um like I, said, I like the the blue bullets is a company that sells those blue ones i like those um they make lots of different um weights for all the different um uh, someone mentioned 45 that's here's a here's a 45 blue bullet right there that's, i use 45s um, you know, just depending on what you want. This extreme makes a, a copper plated bullet and um, 
The, another one I like a lot is berries, B-E-R-R-Y plus three S berries bullets. They make a plated bullet. Um, and th those you can all, those also, if they're available, you can buy online. Um, they're just heavy. Uh, so try to get free shipping on those. Some place that says, oh, spend $50 and get free shipping because those things weigh a ton when you buy them. And again, just starting out, don't invest too much in any one thing, except for the primers. Um, I should use those no matter what, but with the powder, just get a pound with the bullets. Get 250 or 500 at the most. Don't, don't buy, I, bought, I just bought 3,600 blue bullets because I use blue bullets. I've been using them. I'm comfortable with them. I know they work with my gun, blah, 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 blah. Don't buy 4,000 rounds of some bullet until you've worked up a load and know that you're happy with that particular bullet and that's going to feed well under your gun and so forth. Um, so start with smaller quantities, uh, 250, 500 at the most. Unless that's, you know, unless you just really want to have a, <laughs> a garage full of bullets. Because um, you might, I, 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 like I said, I bought those Hornady first, spent a lot of money on bullets I never used. Uh, then I went to the plated bullets and then I decided I like the blue bullets better. And so, yeah. Well, I guess I'll let you guys go then. Thank you so much for your attention and your time. And I appreciate your being my guinea pigs for my first Zoom class and my first reloading class. And uh, I hope you guys all find it uh, useful and hope to see you at the reloading store. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, All right, you guys. Well, you. you have a good rest of the evening and uh, happy Hanukkah tomorrow and happy Christmas mm -hmm. and Merry Christmas uh, later in the month and any other Kwanzaa, whatever else you're celebrating. I, I can't remember there's a Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, this, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> whatever uh -huh. holiday you're celebrating yeah. this year, enjoy them. Um, even if you can't be with your families, there's always Zoom, right? Absolutely. <laughs> be safe, everybody. Happy holidays. Be safe. Good holiday. night, happy guys. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night.